Uh, good evening, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening from wherever you, right, you are right now. So again, thank you very much for joining us today. We are so happy to see you and we will love to hear uh, from where you belong. So please do share in the chat box where you are from and we will love to hear uh, and uh, and know about you. So again, thank you so much for joining. Please use the chat box to sh share your comments and your questions. I will also share the link to download your certificate uh, during the session. You just have to uh, send me a request to access the certificate and I will grant it to you shortly after receiving your request. And again, thank you so much uh, for joining us here. To stay updated, please join our WhatsApp group and do visit our website. I have shared all the links in the chat box. I will share them again. And uh, if you have any suggestions, please do feel free to use the chat box and leave uh, any uh, you know any um topic of your interest and we will be so pleased to uh you, you know organize a webinar on that topic again thank you so much for joining us
Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. You are all welcome to this webinar. We are so pleased to have you here with us today. So again, thanks for joining us from uh, different parts of the world. Please feel free to share uh, where are you from in the chat box. We will be really happy to know. And again, um, you, as I have uh, shared it in my chat box, uh, we will be sharing our certificate link by the end of this session during this webinar. And you just have to send me a request to access your certificate and that will be um, given to you shortly after receiving of your uh, request to access the certificate. So uh, uh, we have got a website like I have shared in the chat box. Please visit it and feel free to subscribe from it as well to stay updated. And um, uh, I've also got this WhatsApp group. This WhatsApp group does have slots so you can easily join it. And if you cannot join it, please do email me and I will um, send you the link to our other WhatsApp group. We have got so many people on WhatsApp. So sometimes we need to create another group to allow as many uh, people to join us and uh, stay updated so again um, there are a few things that uh, i really wish to share with you regarding our initiatives this news neuro initiative is actually for both male and female neurosurgeons it's one of it it's one of its kind and you know it's very innovative we really wish to actually have something which is available for free to every neurosurgeon from all around the world at every stage of their career. So we started this platform and the name women is basically used to um, highlight the importance of women to give them a recognition. So it's like the, just uh, uh, you know a sign of respect and a lot of appreciation to women. I'm a women neurosurgeon myself as well. And most of my colleagues wanted me and they requested me to have something for to make them relate to so that's why i use this um name uh, but it is free for and it's open for our male colleagues as well we are so pleased to welcome our male colleagues and our male seniors and many of them are very supportive uh, for our initiatives and as you know, I have started a free journal, which is known as the newspaper. Um, and and you, it is free for you to publish. It is peer reviewed. It is indexed as well. And I've also got my portal on Web of Science. That will be I will be having my journal uh, sent to uh, sent to be considered by the Web of Science uh, soon after I complete my you know, number of articles. So please send me more articles and all type of articles and all your reviews, your original papers and case reports and case series and letter to editor are welcome. And in case you need more uh, um, guidelines and more guidance regarding research writing, and I, I'm happy to tell you that I've got a course on open edX, uh, which is also totally free of course, and it shows you how to um, write your paper, various kind of papers, so you can just easily have an idea how to uh, write a paper, and it's also free. Uh, Professor James Killew is here. Hi, sir. Hi, sir. Hello, good morning. Good morning, sir. Thank you so much for joining us today so early in your in your part of the world. <laughs> Great to be here. Thank you for this kind invitation. We are all a big fan of yours and we listen to all your wonderful talks and webinars and lectures and everything and your papers as well are also innovative. So we were so eagerly waiting for you and to waiting to listen to you so thank you so much for joining us great sorry if, if i logged in late i just um hopefully no. there's no technic technical issues but uh, the you know the powerpoints they get unstable when they reach four gigabytes so i divided my talk into two talks because it's very heavily video based but um Sure, sir. Sir, uh, you can text your PowerPoint and your videos, please, if you like. You uh, sure. that Let's take a look here. Um.
after uh, this webinar is uh, for you only one speaker webinar. So take your as much time as you like and as much time as uh, you think uh, you are comfortable with. So we will be so happy to listen to you and uh, just uh, make you feel as much comfortable as possible. Great, thank you. So we are so happy to have you here with us. So we all have these, uh, sometimes these uh, technical glitches and uh, net problems. That's why I've also requested everyone to keep their mics and videos off to allow maximum streaming. I think, I hope things will uh, be fine. So whenever you'll be ready, we, I'll be pleased to start the webinar. Okay, I think we're ready to go. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for joining us today. I know you are a very, very busy person, and it's always a matter of great honor and uh, joy to um, have you with us. And um, again, I'm just uh, starting up with this. I'm starting to share my own screen. I'm having a little uh, delay on my side as well right now. Um, again, sir, thank you very, very much. It was a matter of real honor and pleasure to have you. And again, thank you so much for accepting our invitation. We know you have got a very, very busy schedule. So it's uh, it's a huge honor for us to have you here, even with, with uh, you so busy, being so busy and being on the, you know, so early in the morning at your part of the world. So there's a little introduction uh, regarding Professor James Kilyu. He doesn't need any introduction, but for, you know, for the sake of uh, our um, webinars and for the sake of uh, formality, uh, there is, um, he's obviously a professor of neurosurgery and director uh, of all the skull surgery and neurovascular surgery. And he graduated summa cum laude from UCLA, uh, like I've uh, shared here with five Peter Kappa honors and obtained his MD from the New York Medical College with Alpha Omega Alpha honors. And after completing a neurosurgery residency, uh, he just, uh, uh, he just joined the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. He was awarded the Dante Clinical Fellowship at the Congress of Neurological Surgeons, and he obtained advanced fellowship training in skull base, cerebrovascular surgery, and neuro-oncology at the Oregon Health and Science University in Portland. Dr. Liu is renowned for his comprehensive treatment of complex brain tumors and skull base lesions, including physiotherapy tumors, acoustic neuromas, meningiomas, craniopharyngiomas, cordomas, and jugular foramen tumors. We were pleased to have uh, him uh, a few months ago to deliver a lecture on acoustic neuromas and you can and uh, some mind approaches you can listen to that lecture which is available on our youtube channel um if it is not uh, there please let me know i will see if if, if if any of the lecture is the same as one of the most active researchers in his field dr liu has published extensively with over 280 peer-reviewed publication and 30 textbook chapters he has taught many hands-on category dissection courses in skull the surgery and has lectured extensively nationally as well as internationally Nationally throughout the North America, Latin America, Europe, and Asia. Dr. Liu's research is focused on the development of innovative and novel skull based and endoscopic techniques, quantitative surgical neuroanatomy, microsurgical and microvascular national master skills training, virtual surgical simulations, and physiotherapy human biology and clinical outcome of skull based and cerebrovascular surgery. He is an active member of the American Association of Neurological Surgeons, the AANS, and the Congress of Neurosurgery, the CNS, the North American Skull Based Surgery, NSP, Pituitary Network Association, the Face Pain Trajamin Neurology Association, the double ANS CNS joint section for cerebrovascular section. Um, so, uh, and um, he serves on the medical advisory board of the Acoustic Neuroma Association of New Jersey and he's the current secretary of the International Manageoma Society. So again, sir, thank you very, very much for joining us today. Uh, we are so honored and pleased to have you here with us. And uh, sir, the floor is all yours now. Great. Um, thank you, Maria, for that very kind introduction. And um, it's really an honor to be uh, part of your webinar series. And looking at the prior speakers who have had this stage, it's uh, it's a great honor because many of the prior speakers that 
have spoken here are, are many of my heroes and uh, indirect teachers in terms of my development of doing aneurysm surgery. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Um, okay, can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, we can. It's perfect. Okay, terrific. So I just wanted to give a, a, a broad overview of some of the tips and nuances in doing aneurysm clipping. And it's become a, a quite a lost art because, because of the current um, you know, endovascular era. You know, many of these are being treated endovascularly, and it's become more and more difficult to maintain proficiency, but also expertise uh, when doing open surgeries. And I think this is an important topic because it's um, you know, not all aneurysms can be treated endovascularly. And so when you need to do a clipping, you have to do it well and you have to do it safely and your outcomes have to be excellent. So it's important to address this. And I just listed several books here that I think are very helpful for those who are starting out and, and trying to learn how to do the aneurysm surgery. And um, I will refer to some of the illustrations in these texts. They're beautiful illustrations. And so, like I said, uh, aneurysm surgery is becoming a lost art. And, um, you know, they're being treated mostly by endovascular techniques in, in most institutions, at least in the U.S. And, um, you know, the number of aneurysms being treated with open techniques continue to decrease. And in terms of a training perspective, you know, we're, we have workout restrictions for the trainees and it limits their exposure so that's resulting in fewer vascular neurosurgeons with microsurgical and skull-based expertise, but also microvascular bypass experience as well. So is this becoming a lost art? And so we, how can we maintain proficiency? And we know that not all aneurysms, you know, can treat it endovascularly or, or should be treated endovascularly, and some are going to need open treatment. And some may even have failed prior endovascular treatment, and you're going to need some other creative alternatives, perhaps bypass strategies. So it's really important to really master open techniques and provide the best outcome when one is to undergo open aneurysm surgery. And um, achieving mastery, um, I borrowed this concept from uh, Dr. Lawton. I heard one of his talks and, and he has the three H's. You have to have good hands, dexterity, touch and technical skill, a good head on your shoulders, being creative and having good judgment, coming up with a good strategy. And you have to have heart, uh, which is the grit, that, that belly, uh, uh, the fire in your belly, striving for, for perfection. And then I've added a fourth H to this, and I think this is very critical in this time and era, which is hours. And we don't have a lot of time, and we don't have a lot of hours, and we don't have a lot of cases. And so how do we develop that experience? And it's very important. And there are other alternatives to develop that experience. And I think it's through your own personal cases but also for mentorship. And whether it's mentorship from a direct teacher or maybe indirect teacher, you know, you can go and, and go travel to, you know, other destinations and, and spend some time with some experts and see how they do it and observe. And you can do it through a deep, engaging observation. Uh, once you love, reach a level of training, you, know, you can go to a, a center and really analyze, you know, how they do this, what are the nuances and pearls. And if you can't, you have a, a wide library of video uh, material online with all the webinars that have been happening in the last several years. And so hours uh, is important. You know, Malcolm Gladwell talked about this. It takes 10,000 hours to become an expert, but it's not just 10,000 blanket hours. They have to be deliberate hours, focused hours, hours that are focused on concentrating and honing in on those uh, things where you can uh, deliberately enhance your skills. 
So that's an important point we have to think about. Uh, exposure is everything. So don't skimp on the exposures. Uh, you know, when it comes to aneurysm surgery, you have to have room. And it's very important because if you get into trouble, you have to be able to get out of trouble. You have to have, a, have an exit strategy. So doing aneurysm surgery through the smallest possible incision, through the eyebrow and so forth, that might be promoted by others. I, I don't think it's a, a great idea, especially if you're starting to learn how, because you need a wide uh, access and variable angles of attack because sometimes your clipping of the aneurysm need to come from different angles. And if you don't have that exposure, you can't do that. Um, I wanted to uh, talk a little about for the trainees in terms of maximal sphenoid wing drilling. Oftentimes people don't do enough sphenoid wing drilling and there's a lot of overhang that blocks your line of sight. So you need to flatten, you need to find four landmarks, which I teach my residents. When you're drilling the sphenoid wing, and in order to get maximal sphenoid wing drilling, you want to flatten the orbital roof almost to the point of the periorbita, as well as the lateral orbital wall. And you want to be able to visualize this anterior temporal tip. You don't want overhang of the temporal squama looking at your anterior temporal tip. And this gives you that pretemporal exposure. And then you want to take the sphenoid wing resection all the way down to the meningo orbital band. And this is the uh, region where if you want to go any further medially, uh, you have to unlock the cavernous sinus. And you would do that for paraclinoid aneurysms. But this is what gives you a maximal sphenoid wing drilling. You want to do wide splitting of the ceiling fissure. Remember to drain the CSF. We want to use uh, maximal brain relaxation. If a patient has a subarachnoid hemorrhage and the brain is swollen, you have to drain CSF, maybe through the EVD, uh, open up the lamina terminalis uh, early in a tight brain. That's a very useful trick that I do. Uh, I, will, I will almost almost invariably resect the gyrus rectus to expose the ACOM. And you might, you might need to consider anterior clinoidectomy and optic nerve unroofing for paraclinoid ophthalmic aneurysms. Another nice trick is to divide the temporal bridging veins at the sphenoparietal sinus so you can mobilize the temporal lobe posteriorly to get a pretemporal exposure. And I find that technique useful when you're trying to visualize the tentorial incisura or uh, uh, accessing a lateral, uh, getting a lateral trajectory to uh, a PCOM or ophthalmic aneurysm. So uh, splitting the fissure widely. You want to keep the temporal of uh, the, the sylvian vein on the temporal side. And, um, you know, wide, you want to get proximal as well as distal exposure to the aneurysm. And another thing I find helpful is preparation. So before any aneurysm surgery, I go to the 3D workstation in our hospital and I study the 3D and I rotate the, the, the image so that it's in the view of the surgical um, configuration. So here, this is an ACOM, which you can see on an AP view. But then when I rotate it into the surgical view that I predict I'm going to see, I anticipate what kind of clip configuration I'm going to use. And this is the technique called guided imagery or some kind of mental rehearsal is what the pilots of the Blue Angels do, right? You want to visualize what you will see, visualize the attack, visualize what you anticipate at the time of surgery. A very useful tool, I think. So let's take, for example, this is an ACOM that I had uh, treated. And uh, sometimes when you're doing a, an ACOM aneurysm, the general teaching is to come from the side of the dominant A1. And so if you look at this uh, uh, view, uh, this is the side of the dominant uh, A1, so to speak, and, and it's it's important, proximal control. But when I look at it from the left side, you could see I would have the ipsilateral A2 in my view, and I would have to consider a fenestrated clip. Um, not impossible, certainly, you know, very common. But the level of difficulty, I think, goes up by maybe one or two points. 
However, if I rotate the ACOM aneurysm to the right side, notice how the A2s are now not in the way, and I have a straight shot to the ACOM, and I don't need to consider a fenestrated clip reconstruction technique, and um, probably a, a little bit easier to do. So this is what I ended up choosing, and this is the interoperative view you could see coming from the right side. Here's the chiasm. Here's the aneurysm, and as predicted from the 3D, uh, it was a straight shot and um, a series of stacking clips did the job. And here's the post-op uh, uh, angiogram. You can see nice preservation of the ACOM complex. Uh, so uh, laterality is important in ACOM. Now you have to think of yourself like a pilot, right? Before a pilot takes off, what does he do? He checks all his gadgets, his gears. He makes sure that he can land the plane safely with all the passengers on board. You have to do the same when it comes to preparing for an aneurysm case. Not only do you have to study the films, but I make it a routine to come into the room, look at the back table, talk to the nurses, make sure I have everything that I need that I am going to use in my aneurysm surgery. Because the last thing you want is all hell to break loose. You have an intraoperative rupture and you don't have the instrument that you need or the instrument is not available. And it puts you in a very difficult and maybe even dangerous situation. So go through your checklist, make sure you have all the equipment that you need. I've listed some of the things that are important to me. Um, I think you should do the same. Uh, neural monitoring, we routinely use neural monitoring, some general principles, established proximal as well as distal control. And that's important because if you encounter interop or rupture and proximal control is not adequate and the aneurysm is still bleeding, you have to be ready to shut off the faucet, meaning you shut down the aneurysm, you apply a temporary clip for distal control, you slow or maybe even stop the bleeding, and then you can now go ahead and take care of the problem and, and get a better visualization on how to stop the bleeding and clip the aneurysm. So be prepared to use temporary clipping under birth suppression. I always pick out and I load the temporary clips before opening the dura. The last thing you want to do is have the dura open, the aneurysm ruptures, and your nurse is not even prepared to have any clips loaded or ready. So always be ready. Always be prepared for the worst possible outcome intraoperatively. In terms of clipping strategies, think of using the simplest configuration possible, but sometimes you have to think outside the box. Sometimes you need to use some tricks like tandem clipping or stacking or fenestrated clips. Giant aneurysms, you might have to be ready for a thrombectomy, sometimes even a bypass or trapping. So try to avoid an intraop rupture or a neck tear. Be careful with subfrontal retraction on a down pointing ACOM. It's a very common rookie mistake. You elevate the temporal lobe and the neck tears because the ACOM is adherent to the chiasm. Be careful with lateral temporal lobe retraction because of laterally pointing PCOMs or even MCAs because the aneurysm is embedded into the temporal lobe. And so you mobilize the temporal lobe, you rupture the aneurysm. So I'll often do a cordisectomy, release the aneurysm from the temporal lobe, leave the brain, leave a little bit of brain tissue on the aneurysm dome to protect it. And now you can dissect the neck with a little bit more safety and freedom. Uh, again, temporary occlusion, sometimes adenosine pause, trapping, and I'll go over some techniques on suction decompression for giant aneurysms. So here's an example of an ACOM aneurysm, a little bit complex. This would not be a favorable for coiling. Look how it incorporates both A2s. And this is the surgical view. I've rotated the aneurysm into the surgical view. And so you have to be able to put your clip from point A to point B. But on a wide neck aneurysm, you don't want to do that because you have a higher risk of occluding the ACOM flow. 
because of these giant aneurysms. So the technique here is to do a tandem clipping where you use your first clip to reconstruct the distal neck here. And you're gonna take the clipping in two steps. You, you clip the, the, in the long axis, you clip it, and then you leave a remnant. So you come in and sneak in with a smaller clip to take care of the remnant. And this gives you a better uh, reconstruction of this aneurysm. And here's her post-op angiogram, and she had an excellent outcome. So we all have tremor, even at the highest magnification. Uh, so learn to stabilize your tremor. Don't obstruct your line of sight. It's important to always know where the tips of the blades are, uh, and you don't grab perforators. And as you close the blades, you can maneuver and expose more of the anatomy. And you can also use your non-dominant hand as a dissector or a retractor. So you're constantly checking on the neighboring anatomy, checking on perforators. Um, the first clip may not always be the final clip, but by clipping it or the pilot clip, sometimes it helps you define the anatomy and uncover the anatomy so you understand it better. And then you can make your final adjustments and always be ready to come in with your non-dominant hand. So you have to be a little ambidextrous as well. So let's go over some site-specific clipology tips that I think are useful. This is a MCA rupture with a big clot. So I know some colleagues would consider endovascular coiling and then taking the patient for a decompressive craniectomy. I think that's the wrong treatment. I think you should open, do open surgery, take out the clot and clip the aneurysm in one procedure. Okay, because time is brain and the brain is swollen and you don't want the brain to herniate in the angio suite. So take the patient to the OR, do a big craniotomy. Now we do a cordycectomy here to suck out the clot and it makes room for the aneurysm surgery. It relaxes the brain. Of course, you don't want to be too aggressive in removing the clot. You don't want to uncap the aneurysm. And then after you remove the clot, you proceed with your aneurysm surgery. So here we are opening up Sylvian fissure widely. You could see it's a pretty bad subarachnoid hemorrhage. There's a lot of fibrin uh, uh, scarring in the Sylvian fissure, but you have to be able to navigate your way to the Sylvian fissure. Once you find the MCA artery, it's like finding the yellow brick road. Follow the adventitia, stay on the adventitia, don't leave the fibrin material on the vessel, especially when you get to the neck of the aneurysm. And so there's the aneurysm. You can see it's partially calcified. And you can see where the rupture point is. And so I'm going to put a temporary clip on the M1. And here I'm going to do a tandem clip technique. So I'm going to focus on the distal blades and I'm going to preserve that M1, M2 junction on the distal side here. Okay. So this is a left-sided approach. That, so that's the inferior division of M2 right here. Inferior division. And you can see it doesn't close all the way. The aneurysm is partially calcified. A lot of calcium there. So when there's calcium, remember to slightly underclip. If you overclip, you can potentially uh, kink off the M2 takeoff. And this is the tandem clip. You come in with a smaller clip right behind your fenestrated clip. And you take care of the uh, aneurysm by closing the final opening. I'm checking the inferior division of M2. It looks good. Take off the temporary clip. And check the superior division. And here's a fluorescein ICG, which shows excellent filling. And then I follow it with a... I see uh, in designing uh, uh, ICG run. And look at the brain, it's below sea level. It used to be full and swollen and uh, nicely decompressed. I could put the bone back on and she did excellent from this uh, intra rupture. Um, 
This is another uh, ruptured aneurysm. This aneurysm you see here is the uh, arising from the anterior um, or pre uh, uh, bifurcation M1. And um, here we put the uh, EVD intraoperatively. And so again, you could see angry brain, uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage. Going ahead and opening up the arachnoid, opening up the sylvian fissure. And here is the um, here is the distal MCA vessels, and and look how it pretty much matches my three D prediction. So doing this three D uh, nice um, uh, rotation really helps. Now I'm defining the neck of the aneurysm. Now notice how I'm using a right angle ball tip probe defining the proximal, and here's the distal neck and the aneurysm. And now I find a clip that will recreate my right angle ball tip probe, which is a side angled clip. So ergonomically, it makes sense. I'm using the probe and it gives me a understanding of the direction of where the blades need to go. And uh, there's the final clipping. You could see you now, now that the engine is clipped, you wanna check your distal vessels. Make sure your distal MCA vessels are patent, that your blades did not grab them. And you can see the ICG looks good. We pop the aneurysm to ensure it's no longer filling. Before you do that, always have a clip ready in case it's still bleeding. You can add a, a stacking clip to ensure. Uh, and then uh, ruptured cases, I always open up the lamina terminalis and I open up the uh, membrane of Lilliquis. So you want to be able to open up all those CSF cisterns in order that uh, you can minimize the risk of uh, post-operative uh, uh, shunt-dependent hydrocephalus. So here we are opening uh, the lamina, I'm sorry, the membrane of Lilliquist. This is between the carotid oculomotor triangle. And uh, I always look for the basilar artery and then suction out all the prepontine blood in the posterior fossa. And there's the final view. Uh, you can see, again, nicely relaxed brain after, uh, after clipping the subarachnoid hemorrhage. That's what you want to see. You don't want to see swollen brain. And then here's the post-op uh, angiogram. You can see no residual. Patient was neurologically intact. Um, this is an interesting case. This was a 59-year-old uh, female who had a prior aneurysm rupture from the MCA. She was treated in another state with coiling of the MCA. And of course, it's um, they left a uh, residual neck after coiling with a difficult complex aneurysm like this. I think this should have been treated with clipping up front, but nevertheless, here we are. Here's the residual um, post coiling and patient uh, relocated to New Jersey. We restudied her and there was further recurrence. And so now we're left with a, a difficult uh, problem. Uh, what is the best strategy here? Uh, I think you should always try to reclip it if you can, but always be prepared for uh, coil extraction and also for possible bypass and trapping. So here is the um, terrional exposure. Here we've dissected the aneurysm neck, and uh, there's the M2, there's the M1, here's M1, here are the two M2s. So the aneurysm is nicely exposed. You can see it's got a very thick wall. And under birth suppression, I'm going to put a temporary M1, and then my first attempt is to try to clip it with a, a fenestrated clip because it's got higher closing force. But look at the coil mass. It's pushing the clips down to occlude the MCA. So now I'm gonna trap it and I'm gonna be prepared to open the aneurysm and thrombectomize it and extract the coils. Now, before you do this, before you shut off the flow to the MCA, you gotta make sure your CUSA or sonopet or aspirator is running. The last thing you wanna do is shut off flow to the MCA, open the aneurysm and your instrument is not working. That's not a good situation. So make sure your sonopet is working. 
And so we take out the thrombus. We're doing an endarterectomy here with micro scissors. And then now the coil mass is mobilized away. We can start to clip it. I don't need to remove the coil mass entirely. I can come back to that later. I'm working under pressure here because I've shut off flow to the MCA. So now we do a tandem clip. It looks good initially. We remove, remove all the clips and we do intraoperative Doppler. But look at the inferior division of M2 there. It looks blue and there's no Doppler signal. So now my M2 is occluded. What do you do in this situation? So first I take off one clip to see if that reopens the flow. There's no flow. Now what do you do? Well, you got to reestablish flow in the M2 or else you can have a big stroke. So I reclip the uh, M1 and the other M2, and now we have to inspect the lumen. You want to re-explore the lumen. You want to see if there's an intimal flap or some kind of debris occluding, and you want to get some back bleeding from that M2. You could see there's some debris in the wall of the aneurysm. So I need to do more aggressive thrombectomy, clean out the debris, reapply the M2. Now I'm going to squirt the heparinized saline. You can see the lumen is nicely open again. And then I'll redo my clip con construction. Here I'm using a uh, angled fenestrated clip in a tandem clip fashion for higher closing force. Take out the M1. Now you have to remember to underclip. If you overclip this to make it look perfect on the extra luminal side, you're going to end up occluding the intraluminal side. So underclip. And now I have time that the aneurysm is protected. I can go ahead and finish off removing the coil mass and then finishing my tandem clip technique by coming in with a baby clip on the backside. And then for reinforcements, uh, I'll add one more uh, clip. And then here you could see I've underclipped it. Remember there's calcium thick walled and then the ICG angiography looks good. There's good flow there. And uh, that finishes this, uh, this um, clip strategy here. Here's the post-op angiogram. You can see excellent reconstruction of this MCA bifurcation. Very nice result. The patient was neurologically intact with no strokes. And this case shows you that you have to be ready to deal with all types of problems. And if you see an M2 occluded, don't just say, oh, I can't take care of that problem. Be aggressive. Preserve all vascular perforators and vessels. You have to go back and reopen that M2. Don't leave the clip on there and say, oh, I'll take the patient to angio suite and reopen the M2. No, that's not going to happen. You're at surgery now. Time is brain. There's no flow going into that M2. Figure out how to open it up. So here's a, um, a small aneurysm, uh, small but complex in some ways. It, the aneurysm is incorporating the, the M1 trunk. And so what I'm doing is I'm using a fenestrated clip and I stacked it vertically because it was incorporating the bifurcation on the back side. So that longer clip uh, uh, took care of that. And then I'm using a series of stacking clips to reconstruct uh, this uh, bulbous aneurysm. And although the aneurysm might be small, uh, using this uh, picket fence technique really helps um, reconstruct this aneurysm to get the perfect clip configuration. And you can see on the fluorescein and ICG, uh, it's an excellent reconstruction here. Here's the 3D. Uh, view. So let's change the directions a little bit. Anterior communicating aneurysms. There's four types. Inferiorly pointing here. Remember what I said about inferiorly pointing. Uh, elevation of the, the frontal lobe uh, can risk tearing the neck. And you could see this was a uh, an ACOM stuck to the tuberculum cella and a small tiny aneurysm that uh, uh, caused an intra rupture, but able to take care of it with a small mini clip. Uh, again, look at this ant, uh, inferiorly pointing ACOM. Look how it's adherent to the chiasm. 
this can be a bit treacherous. Uh, just to get enough exposure to put the clip blades around the neck, which is point A to point B. You don't need to dissect the aneurysm off the chiasm. Uh, this could risk further uh, visual loss. Um, so uh, anteriorly pointing um, a little bit away from the chiasm. You can see this is a larger aneurysm here. In a large aneurysm like this, uh, I'll often use temporary clip and then define the neck and then always define the contralateral A2, the contralateral A1, and then the contralateral recurrent artery humor in addition to its ipsilateral counterparts. So you want to identify all those things before you commit to uh, the final clip configuration to avoid any infarct. Now, this one was a little bit more tricky. This was a, a bulbous looking um, anteriorly pointing uh, ACOM. This, uh, I often like to do a, a orbital terrional. It gives you a little added room of exposure. This shows you just the initial uh, Sylvian uh, fissure opening. So we keep the temporal vein on the uh, temporal side as, as explained earlier and uh, opening up the arachnoid widely. And then here is the left uh, ICA and medial to that is the optic nerve. And then mobilize your scope in all directions to where your targeted anatomy needs to be exposed. Here's the olfactory tract. And so here I am doing a gyrus rectus exposure. I often do this for ACOMs, and this helps you expose those uh, vessels in the inner hemispheric fissure. And always be careful of where recurrent artery of Huebner is. Uh, it can come up on you, uh, and it can sneak up on you um, in some cases. So uh, I am careful not to take any perforators and follow all perforators back to its origin, and if it originates at A2 or the A1-A2 junction, uh, you know, be careful that that could be the recurrent artery of Huebner. And so once we've defined the neck here, I'm using a fenestrated clip uh, going laterally right across the neck. I like fenestrated clips. They're, um, they have a higher closing force, and the way they close are more parallel as opposed to what I call like an alligator uh, bite closure. Uh, it's just easier to see the anatomy uh, sometimes using a fenestrated clip, even though I'm not using it to fenestrate any structure. Uh, again, it's got higher closing force. So if you have a thick walled aneurysm, it gives you a, a better closure. And then, you know, reinforce your, uh, your clipping. Here I'm stacking another uh, clip right on top of it. And, and you have to look for the blades. I'm checking for the clip blades as I'm closing it, making sure I don't grab any important arteries on the, on the deeper side. And then any small residual, uh, I like to use this three millimeter or even five millimeter mini clip just to take care of a small little dog ear, just to get that perfect uh, clip construction without any residual dog ear. And so it, remember to inspect all the vessels. Here's the ICG. And we confirm that recurrent artery humor is intact here. The ACOM is intact. And the contralateral A2 and the ipsilateral A2 are patent as well. Here's the uh, post-op angiogram. You can see nice filling of both A2s. And then the superiorly pointing ones, I think, um, these present more of a challenge because oftentimes the ipsilateral A2 vessel is in your way. So this is where you need to be prepared for uh, knowing how to use a fenestrated clip to fenestrate the ipsilateral A2. So this one uh, was a little bit more complex because it was incorporating the A1, A2 junction. Look how bulbous it is. This is the ipsilateral A1. This is A2. The ACOM is here. The ipsilateral, contralateral A1 is on the other side. So here we're using a fenestrated clip to uh, 
reconstruct that A1, A2 junction. And at the same time, you have to preserve the ACOM and the contralateral A2 as well. So here I realized I grabbed the contralateral A2. So now I'm readjusting. Here's the contralateral A2. I'm able to swing my angle uh, in a different direction. So now I see our contralateral A2. Contralateral A2 is right here in the, in the gyrus rectus exposure. It's preserved. And look at the ACOM. ACOM here is preserved. And so I can now begin to stack the fenestrations to recreate the A1, A2 uh, lumen. So you could see there remains another bulbous uh, portion of the engine superiorly. So we'll add a third uh, fenestrated clip. This is a, a stacking fenestrated reconstruction to recreate the tube of A1, A2. You can see there's A1 and 2. And I'm using the, um, the bigger fenestrated clip. These are the 5 millimeter fenestration as opposed to the 3 millimeter. And I prefer these because uh, you don't want to risk any kinking or, or occlusion of those A2s. And so ICG shows uh, excellent filling here. Uh, very satisfactory result. Here's ACOM and contralateral A1. You see how it's hypoplastic. Uh, and this is a, a nice example of the stacking fenestrated clip constru construction. Here's the ACOM nicely reconstructed. These, these are the contralateral injection, hypoplastic A1, like I mentioned. And then posteriorly pointing, uh, I often use right angle clips to grab the backside uh, of the neck for posteriorly pointing. And sometimes you can have multiple aneurysms. This is what I call the three headed dragon. As I study the 3D, look how there's an aneurysm. This is a, a triplicate A2s. There's three A2s that are involved here, largely why there's multiple aneurysms at multiple branch points on this. But there's one off of the ACOM, that's number three. You have another uh, several aneurysms coming off of these triplicates. And if I rotate it into the surgical view, pay attention to the image on the right. This is what I anticipate at surgery. And again, keeping track of all the aneurysms, look at uh, here's number one, here's number two, here's number three. And so here's the video. Viral. So this is the view. And through a right terrional approach, we're going to clip aneurysm number one using a fenestrated clip. And we're going to fenestrate the ipsilateral A2 vessel. And we got the neck secured. And there's a little residual just above the clip. So we'll use come in with a smaller straight clip to take care of that uh, first aneurysm. And then clipping of the uh, aneurysm number two, I'm using a right angle clip here. I'm sorry, a, uh, a bayoneted clip, sorry. And then using a bayoneted clip for aneurysm number three to reconstruct that ACOM. And then we'll do fluorescein angiography showing preservation of all triplicate A3s. And here's the post-op angiogram you can see uh, preservation of all of those. And this is the angiogram and the patient was neurologically intact. PCOMs, when you're dealing with PCOMs, be careful and identify the PCOM knuckle, but also identify where the anterior choroidal is. So you don't want to occlude the anterior choroidal. It's, um, you need to preserve that to avoid a stroke. And especially for fetal PCOMs, you have to preserve the uh, PCOM takeoff. So here's an example. Um, this is an example of taking the anterior temporal bridging vein so I can mobilize the temporal lobe posteriorly. I believe this is a, a right-sided approach to this PCOM aneurysm. So now this is an unruptured aneurysm. So now I can mobilize the temporal lobe posteriorly this is a pretemporal exposure. You can see there's the third nerve. There's the PCOM takeoff. This looks like a larger P, uh, PCOM, perhaps a fetal PCOM. And there's the choroidal. This is a, 
an endoscopic view. I think the endoscope is a useful adjunct in aneurysm surgery. Helps you uh, define the anatomy, look around corners. And so here we're just using a bayonet clip to come across the neck of the aneurysm. Be careful of the tip of the clip blades that it doesn't grab the, the PCOM as it's passing posteriorly deeper in the, in the field. And uh, here's the fluorescein angiography showing nice filling of the PCOM knuckle and the choroidal takeoff. And here's a nice view of the choroidal. Here's the choroidal uh, uh, takeoff. And then we'll use the endoscope again to take a look. Here's the PCOM. Here's the PCOM here. And then this is the choroidal takeoff. This is another laterally pointing uh, PCOM. This was a ruptured case in a, in a young man, uh, 21 years old. So young man, ruptured aneurysm, favorable anatomy for clipping. This will be a, a permanent cure for him. Coil occlusion for a 21-year-old carries, you know, lifetime risk of recurrence and retreatment. So why not give this young patient a cure? So here's the opening of the Sylvian Fisher, ruptured case. And here's the aneurysm being defined. Here's the choroidal that you see, choroidal takeoff. Now the aneurysm starts to rupture here. I don't know if you can appreciate that, but it's actually ruptured, it's starting to bleed. What you don't wanna do is take your suction out of the field. The minute you take your suction out of the field, you've, you've lost your position with the aneurysm. Keep the suction in the field, keep the bleeding away, keep your cool, keep calm, ask for the clip and clip the aneurysm. But at the same time, Look at the choroidal. Don't include the choroidal. The choroidal is here. You can see it's preserved. And this was actually my resident. I was, um, I was on the teaching scope and it ruptured. So there was no time for us to switch positions. I had to coach him through it. I had to say, <laughs> I had to say, keep still, tell the nurse to give the resident the clip and, and just apply it. And so that took care of the problem. Uh, Periclinoid aneurysms, these are a little bit more tricky. Uh, this requires a, a knowledge of skull base surgery and, and know, knowing the anterior process. The anterior process is often uh, 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 obstructing the view of the neck of the aneurysm, but it also takes up space for where the clip is going to sit. So you need to create all those rooms, and you also have to untether the optic nerve because. Uh, as you're uh, applying the clip, the nerve is, is tethered often by the dome of the aneurysm, and you have to know how to release the uh, optic nerve. So this is an example of uh, extradural clinoidectomy. Uh, you have to cut the meningo-orbital band to unlock the cavernous sinus, and it allows you to unroof the optic nerve canal and, and take out the clinoid. And then this is the exposure you'll expose the clinoidal segment of the uh, uh, ICA. This is an intradural uh, technique where you open and fillet open the dura and then unroof the optic canal. Always unroof the optic canal first and then remove the clinoid uh, until you see the optic strut and you wanna be able to expose the distal dural ring. And so I often do, will do a hybrid technique. I drill out 95% of it extradurally and then I come back and take care of the rest uh, intradurally. And, and when we're doing a, a carotid ophthalmic aneurysm, uh, I like to use the uh, side angled or side curved clip because um, you come in laterally and then you rotate your hand so that the shank of the clip is pointing towards the proximal ICA. And this allows you to keep your clip blades parallel to the course of the ICA. Uh, it's a nice technique. Here's an example. This is an a, a unruptured carotid ophthalmic. Look at the optic nerve, how the dome is totally stretched over the optic nerve. 
causing some visual symptoms. And uh, we come in with a side curved clip. You see how the clip blades are going across the neck of the aneurysm. And now you rotate your hand so that the shank uh, of the clip is pointing proximally and the blades are pointing parallel to the course of the ICA. Here's the ICG angiography. Nice filling of the ICA. This is a lady with multiple aneurysms. Uh, I believe she has a, uh, here you can see she's got a left ophthalmic aneurysm, a left MCA, small one, and then a contralateral superior hypophyseal artery. So you can do three endovascular procedures maybe, or maybe one clipping. So let's take care of it with one clipping. Here's the left MCA. So again, study the 3D anatomy. Uh, here, since we're doing a paraclinoid aneurysm, we're going to cut the meningo orbital band. We're going to unlock the cavernous sinus, peeling the dura propria off of the cavernous sinus. And now I'm drilling the clinoid process extradurally, unroofing the optic nerve canal. You got to use copious irrigation. Uh, eggshell technique, you don't want to injure the optic nerve, wide splitting of the sylvian fissure. And there's the MCA aneurysm as predicted on the 3D, defining the neck of the MCA aneurysm. and then applying the uh, clip of the, the left MCA under temporary occlusion. Temporary clipping here only lasts roughly two minutes or less. So it's, it's not really much of a risk. And then inspecting. And then here's a second, actually a little baby bleb right at the bifurcation. So we'll use a little small three millimeter clip and just close off that little daughter aneurysm. Now we're going to go after the uh, ophthalmic artery aneurysm. We're opening up the suprachiasmatic cistern. Here's the contralateral hypophyseal aneurysm pointing medially. It's actually right in the prechiasmatic space. Very favorable to just clip here. And then we'll use a gentle curved clip to wrap around the curve of the artery so that there's no residual neck. And this is a nice favorable anatomy to do from the contralateral side. And then we'll open up the falciform ligament. You have to untether the optic nerve. You don't want to put any stretch injury on the optic nerve. And now we can see and define the neck of the left ophthalmic artery aneurysm. Here is the uh, distal neck right here. Remember to stay right on the adventitia of the artery. You want to get rid of all those arachnoid bands because that can uh, preclude you from placing the clip properly. And uh, there's an intraoperative rupture. So again, keep your suction in the field. Don't panic. Keep your suction in the field. I already know where the clip blades are going to be. I've already defined the neck, so just stay cool and uh, clip the aneurysm, all right? Keep your suction in the field. Keep your concentration. Talk to your staff. Talk to your assistant. Take control of the room. Don't lose control of the room. Command, command the room. Tell them what you need. And take care of the problem. So there is the uh, nice uh, floor scene angiography. There's the ICG. Excellent reconstruction of all aneurysms. And there's the, um, the view of the uh, contralateral hypophyseal. And everything is nicely, nicely occluded. Uh, what about this one? This is a giant paraclinoid aneurysm in the face of subarachnoid hemorrhage. 
Uh, this was uh, before the pipeline era, but I know many of my colleagues would treat this with pipeline. Um, but in the face of subarachnoid hemorrhage, I think that still remains a point of potential controversy. So in the face of rupture, you may need to clip this. And so this is Professor Sugita, for those who don't know, from Nagoya University, who was a pioneer in aneurysm surgery, developed the fenestrated clips, Sugita clips here, to reconstruct the lumen. This is uh, Hunt Bajer and Duke Sampson, who popularized this Dallas technique to do uh, retrograde suction decompression to help deflate and soften the dome of the aneurysms. And I'll show you an example. This is a uh, giant carotid ophthalmic artery aneurysm with visual loss and retroorbital headaches. So here we're going to clip this aneurysm so we can relieve pressure on the optic nerve. Because of its large size, we're going to do uh, the Dallas technique, the retrograde suction decompression. You have to expose the neck to get proximal control. And the key steps here are doing the craniotomy. And so we'll show you the surgical video. Here we're um, cutting the meningorbital band, exposing the cavernous sinus. And so you want to uh, use sharp dissection. You want to cut these periosteal fibers that attach the temporal uh, dura propria to the uh, membranous periosteal layer of the cavernous sinus. So I've unlocked the cavernous sinus. I can see the anticlinal process. I'm going to unroof the optic nerve canal first. Here's the optic nerve. Use copious irrigation to avoid thermal injury. And now I can remove the anticlinal process. This is the optic strut I'm drilling. And then after we remove the clinoid, we'll open up the sylvian fissure. This is a very, very favorable fissure here, the non-interjigitating type. And now we'll open up the arachnoid of the optic nerve. Look how the optic nerve is on stretch. It's fanned out by the pressure of the dome of the aneurysm. And now... I'm going to open up the dura right over the orbit. And this is going to give me a combined intra and extradural exposure. And from this exposure, I'm going to open up the falciform ligament. You should open the falciform ligament lateral to the optic nerve, as opposed to directly over the optic nerve at, at where it's on stretch. So the safest area is to, to come on the side and then I can take off the falciform ligament and excise it. And now I want to expose the distal dural ring. Now, remember, the distal dural ring is, um, is a ring that's adherent to the wall of the artery. It's not a potential space. So you have to create the distal ring. You have to cut the dura in such a way there's a cuff around the artery. Now, we're going to uh, occlude the um, common carotid and the external carotid. And so we've got proximal control. Now we're clipping the distal ICA. So now the aneurysm is trapped. Now we take a butterfly needle and apply retrograde suction decompression. Uh, you can aspirate this with a syringe or apply it to a gentle suction. And here you'll see the aneurysm deflate. Look how the aneurysm is deflated. There's the ophthalmic artery takeoff right here. And now this gives you a good 20 to 30 seconds. You can start to define the neck of the aneurysm, understand it, and then have all your clips ready. I have a side curved clip like I had mentioned before. The clip blades will go across the neck of the aneurysm and then close off the neck of the aneurysm here. So there's the clip. And we'll remove the butterfly needle, put a single suture, 
to uh, stop the bleeding from the entry point. And then we'll take off our temporary clips to the external. We'll do our ICG here. And I want to, you to pay attention to, initially it looks good, but you could see after you wait a few seconds, you start to have slow filling of the dome. So where's the filling from? It's coming from this little thing that I call the thigh gap of the aneurysm clip. It's a little, little gap right between the blades. I call it the thigh gap. So I can take care of that little residual by putting a clip right over the thigh gap area and it closes off the aneurysm. And you can see the optic nerve is nicely decompressed. Excellent decompression. And you repeat the ICG and there's no more feeling. Patient also had a second aneurysm. This is the uh, A1 aneurysm. And with these A1 lenticulostriate aneurysms, uh, they're often on the backside. So you often have to use a right angle clip and you wanna see the tip of the clip blades across the A1 before you close it. And you don't wanna include the lenticulostriates. You do an ICG and you confirm that the lenticulostriate vessels are all patent. And here's the post-op angiogram. You can see the paraclinoid aneurysm has been taken care of, and there's no A1 stroke. An extradural optic nerve decompression. And I want to show you an example of direct suction decompression. This is a, a paper we published some years ago. Uh, this is dealing with that paraclinoid aneurysm uh, I showed you earlier. So we're opening up the falciform ligament here. You can see the nerve is kinked at the falciform ligament. And then we're gonna open up the dura and recreate the distal dural ring. This is the distal dural ring being exposed. So you cut the dura in a 270 degree fashion. And now we have proximal control of the uh, ICA. We have distal control of the ICA. So we'll now apply uh, the, uh, the temporary clip proximally. There was enough room to apply temporary clip proximally, so I didn't have to open the neck, but I had the neck prepped. Always important to have the neck prepped on a paraclinoid aneurysm. And now we're gonna do direct suction decompression, not retrograde through the neck, but a direct decompression by putting a needle through the dome and the aneurysm. But look how um, the calcified neck is causing the clip blades to slip. And it's causing it to slip down on the parent artery, which can occlude it. So now I have to regroup and think about a different strategy. I'm going to put the tip of the clip blades before the calcium. And um, you want to be careful that the blades don't tear the neck of the aneurysm because of the calcium that's there. But now I'll reinforce it with a, uh, a straight vertical fenestrated clip. So it's the use of the Sugita technique with fenestrated clips to recreate the tube of the ICA. And any remnants I can take care of with these gentle curved clips. We'll take off the, uh, the distal temporary clip now. Now I wanna look for the choroidal. So there's the choroidal takeoff. I have to dissect the choroidal artery off of the dome of the aneurysm and protect it. So I know where the distal neck is now. Now I see the distal neck, I can readjust this clip so that, uh, or apply a new clip that is, and I'm using the suction to hold the choroidal artery away from the neck. And I'm looking at the heel of this right angle clip blade to make sure it doesn't occlude the choroidal artery. And so I'm just gonna readjust this and then I can put another vertical 
clip here to reinforce, which I do. We puncture the aneurysm with a needle. It's no longer filling. And I take off the proximal temporary clip. You could see this is the final or the near final configuration. And there's a dog ear here, lateral to the ICA. I inspect to see if it's collapsible with the face of the calcium. And it looks like I can apply a gentle curved clip going lateral to medial to recreate the tube of the ICA. And this is the reconstruction at the end. I think it's very satisfactory. Uh, I'm very pleased with it. And of course, the ICG shows excellent filling of the ICA, but and also the choroidal. Look at the choroidal vessel down here. And then this is the post-op angiogram. You can see excellent reconstruction of the ICA. Um, this is a giant ophthalmic aneurysm that ruptured. Uh, the issue here is that there's no ACOM collaterals. So if you were to sacrifice this ICA, uh, there's no ACOM to uh, come from the other side to cross fill. And so um, here we did what's called a prophylactic bypass. This was before the, the flow diverting era, case early in my career. Um, we do a ECA, saphenous vein to M2 bypass, prophylactic bypass, so that uh, in preparation to clip the aneurysm, because you you don't know, you have to be prepared for the worst. So this is the uh, ECA endocyte anastomosis. This was the distal vein graft to M2 anastomosis. And then we'll go ahead and clip the aneurysm. Uh, there was an interop rupture, but everything went well. And so here you can see this is the final view. You have uh, the vein graft coming in and the aneurysm is taken care of. So something to consider. Uh, let me switch to uh, my second slides due to the size of this lecture. Um, So I just want to talk briefly on some posterior circulation aneurysms. Uh, posterior circulation are, are more rare. Uh, some are more difficult, and a lot of them are being treated endovascularly, so uh, not a lot of cases to develop uh, experience. But you got to know the anatomy. The anatomy of the basilar trunk and the basilar apex can be accessed through the carotid ocular motor triangle. Here are some tips on how to open up that space, anteroclinoidectomy, open up the distal dural ring, doing transcavernous, optic ocular motor nerve release, and sometimes even posterior clinoidectomy. Here's an example of an ICA, two aneurysms, uh, ICA. Excuse me, sir, sir, I think uh, the slides have not been changed. Can you please stop sharing and reshare again? Uh, we are seeing, still seeing the previous, yes, sir. <laughs> we were still seeing the previous lecture. Oh, sorry. Okay. No, no, yeah, it's okay. So it's actually a glitch in the Zoom itself. So okay. it keeps on showing the previous ones. Yes. Let me make sure I. Yeah, this is it. Okay. Exactly. Thank you, sir. Do you see it now? Yes. Can we see? Okay. We can see that. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Sorry about that. Yes, Thank you. For... Show your cases. Great. Thank you for alerting me. So this is uh, th these are the techniques to expose the carotid ocular motor triangle to the basilar apex. You can see, as I mentioned earlier, this is the uh, a case with two aneurysms. This is a, a, a ICA aneurysm. Uh, it's uh, actually fusiform. It, you can't appreciate it on the angiogram, but you'll see. You'll see it on the uh, interop view. And then there's a basilar apex aneurysm here as well. I look at the 3D and I can study the ICA aneurysm. And then this is the basilar apex aneurysm. You could see it's a little bit complex. Uh, I consulted my endovascular colleague who felt that this would be too difficult to treat endovascularly. Although he did say you could do a pipeline for the ICA. So I felt we could try to clip both. And I think that was would be a good solution. 
So here's the video uh, showing the access. This is um, an orbitoterional approach. We do an anterior clinectomy extradurally. We then open up the sylvian fissure widely using sharp dissection. Open up the sylvian fissure with micro scissors. Don't use a blunt rotin six dissector. That's uh, the improper way to open up a sylvian fissure. Use the scissors. And uh, there's the third nerve. Look how the third nerve is displaced by this ICA aneurysm. This is not a PCOM. This is a posterior carotid wall aneurysm. And we put a temporary clip here. And now I'm going to reconstruct the lumen of the ICA using angled, right angled fenestrated clips. So I use a right angle fenestrated and then I follow it with a straight fenestrated clip. Look for the PCOM and choroidals on the lateral side here. So you don't want to occlude the choroidal. And then I'll reinforce the remainder of that aneurysm dome with a straight fenestrated. Take off the temporary clip. The ICA is nicely reconstructed. So now I can safely go into the carotid oculomotor triangle now. Now that the carotid aneurysm is taken care of, here's a small perforator. I'm going to preserve this perforator. This is a, a small PCOM. I know some people will divide the PCOM to get better access. Uh, it's a that can be a useful adjunct to keep in mind. I, I always try to see if I can preserve it. Now there's the aneurysm. That's a basilar apex, and we're going to use a tandem clip technique. We're going to use a fenestrated clip to apply the clip blades to the distal portion of the neck, focusing on the P1 basilar junction. There's P1, and I'm going to pay close attention to make sure the clip blades don't occlude the contralateral P1. And I apply the first clip and then reinspect. You could see there's a little residual on the back side here. This is the back side of the apex, little small dog ear. How am I going to fix that? Uh, I just use a small mini clip here. And then as I'm closing the blades, I'm lifting up against the back wall of the basilar. And that takes care of the aneurysm here. Here are the still images. You can see that's the fusiform ICA reconstructed with fenestrated clips. And then there's the basilar with tandem clip. So here's the postoperative angiogram. Uh, excellent reconstruction. And she was neurologically intact. Here's a ruptured distal uh, SCA aneurysm. You can see there's bleeding here around the uh, brainstem. Uh, you could tell this is not a regular aneurysm. This is a pseudo aneurysm. Look at the, I call this the Hiroshima mushroom cloud. Look at, this is the rupture point. And this is not a true aneurysm. Be, beware of this. This is a a false aneurysm and it's going to rupture. It's quite distal in the SCA. The patient uh, had a mycotic aneurysm and she already had a stroke in the SCA distribution. Uh, so I felt that uh, doing a Kawasis approach, my view of the SCA would be looking at the long axis of the SCA as opposed to retrosigmoid where uh, the view of the SCA is a more difficult uh, because it's more along the, the, the axis of the lumen. Uh, my hopes was to potentially uh, reattach the SCA if possible or repair the hole. But here's the, uh, the Kawasi's uh, approach. I'm cutting the tentorium now. And now I'm opening the arachnoid over the posterior fossa. And uh, you'll see... Uh, I haven't even touched the aneurysm yet. I'm just opening up the arachnoid and I slowly see some pulsations here. And I know something is about to happen because this is a pseudo aneurysm. There's no wall. It's just a big hole in the artery. And you can see we don't have great proximal control here. This becomes a, a very ominous situation. I try to coagulate, which is a, a pretty useless technique here. So keep my cool. I get some temporary clips and I'm trying to get some control here. With a little bit of luck, I grab uh, something to stop the bleeding. And now I can 
better uh, inspect now that the bleeding stopped. I've now inspected and I, I found the proximal SCA here. So I put a temporary clip on the proximal SCA. And now there's the distal SCA. So now I found both ends of the SCA. And my hopes is to see if I can reanastomose this. But look, this artery is all diseased. It looks like a, a shotgun has gone off on the artery. <clears throat> the wall of this artery is completely diseased. And I decide to just uh, leave the artery occluded. He already, she already had a, a stroke in this area, so it was inconsequential. But here you could see the view, anatomical view of the SCA. And, uh, and she did well from, uh, from this uh, uh, surgery. This is a pica aneurysm. It's a distal pica dissection, dissecting aneurysm, fusiform, incorporating the inflow and the outflow with a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So how would you take care of this problem? Can you clip reconstruct this? Can you coil this? Should you just bypass this or maybe cut out the aneurysm and reattach, reimplant uh, the proximal to the distal end? So all of these things came to my mind. Um, my first thought was to always try to clip reconstruct, but then I was prepared to uh, uh, divide and excise and re-implant re and reanastomose the two ends of the pica. Uh, this was done through a midline suboccipital approach. This is the contralateral pica. And uh, here is the ipsilateral pica. And uh, we'll do a, a, a tonsil, tonsil, subpeel tonsillar resection. This is like doing a gyrus rectus to create a little bit more room. Exposure is everything. So we open up the arachnoid, and this is the uh, distal control um, of the pica. Here's the proximal control. Here's the proximal control pica. This is the distal control. So you have the two ends now. This is the neck of the aneurysm. It's You keep it in, in the fibrin clot so you avoid interop rupture. Here's the inflow, here's the outflow. Can I reconstruct this or should I do some kind of anastomosis? I'm gonna temporarily clip it first. In fact, I think I trapped the aneurysm here. So the aneurysm has actually shut off to all blood supply. So I've shut off the faucet, so to speak. Now I can safely better define this aneurysm so I can try to uh, reconstruct it better. And so what I decided here is that there's a lot of pressure here. So I'm going to deflate the aneurysm, collapse it. There's no flow going in it. So now I can figure out if I can reconstruct this. So I'm going to apply a uh, straight clip here. And then I'm going to stack my clips here to recreate the lumen of the pica recreate the pica here without occluding it. A little bit of calcium on the neck there. So remember to underclip it. We'll remove the temporary clips. Temporary clipping here was probably less than three minutes or so. And you can see the aneurysm is no longer filling. And uh, we'll just re-inspect this. It's, it's a nice reconstruction, I think. So I didn't have to uh, bypass it or re-implant. I was able to simply clip reconstruct this. You could see I was able to do a stacking configuration and uh, preserve the flow through the pica. And we'll do an ICG. You can see there's no stagnation of flow. It flows quite nicely. Check all sides. And here's the final view. She had an excellent outcome, living a normal life now. And here's the 3D. You can see this is uh, by trapping and decompressing. You can re reconstruct and apply the clips. 
And lastly, I show you this case. This was an interesting case. You can see a young patient. This patient was in his 20s, uh, had a big, bad rupture, uh, almost uh, herniating. And you can see on this 3D CT angiogram, this is the tonsillar loop of one of the picas. And then you don't see a tonsillar loop on the other side, but you have this artery here. And then this is the aneurysm. And what we found was you could see a pica uh, on one side, but then the other side, you didn't see a pica in the subarachnoid space, but you saw a big artery on the convexity of the cerebellum. So what I had to do was I realized that this was not a pica aneurysm, but this was a ica pica variant. So ica pica is... Uh, is a uh, flow coming from ICA providing distribution to the pica, but it's no longer in the subarachnoid space. It's in the cortex of the cerebellum. So you have to do a cortisectomy, suck out the clot and find the aneurysm, which was in the parenchyma of the cerebellum, not the subarachnoid space because the ICA pica distally is on the cortical surface of the of the aneurysm. So look at this Ica pica branch. And this is where the aneurysm was. It was in the parenchyma. And we were able to take care of that aneurysm. And lastly, I show you this one. This is a, a, a pica dissection, approximately at the VA pica junction, subarachnoid hemorrhage. And so the strategy here is this is. Uh, a difficult one to, to treat with clipping. And you don't want to sacrifice the pica. We want to preserve all vessels. So here we're going to do a side-to-side -side anastomosis, bring the two picas together. And you want to make your uh, you want to make your arteriotomy at 10 and 2 o'clock. And we'll go ahead and make our anchoring suture here. And then you start to uh, suture the uh, backside of the lumen and you have to go uh, inside uh, to inside. And then I'll tie the suture at the end so that uh, I've already taken care of the backside. I can start running a new suture instead of one continuous suture uh, so that it gives me a little bit more security and then suturing the top side and then taking off the temporary clips. And then we'll do an ICG. Shows excellent anastomosis. Follow it with a fluorescein angiography. And then now that with the now that the uh, uh, bypass has been uh, taken care of, we'll go ahead and trap. The aneurysm, you could see it's uh, it's got a roller coaster like corkscrew configuration. We'll trap the aneurysm and uh, apply the distal uh, clip here as well. And then uh, here's the post op angiogram. You could see the pica pica bypass here is intact. Bypass is intact, and uh, a patient did quite well. So I'll conclude here. I think there remains a role for open surgery for aneurysms. We must maintain our proficiency and expertise, and it's becoming more challenging in this new generation of uh, endovascular therapy. So in order to preserve the craft, we gotta have dedication, we gotta have commitment, and we gotta have mentorship. So if you're starting out, don't be ashamed to ask for help. Don't be ashamed to go seek the advice and go to the site of the experts so that it can improve your game, improve your technical skills. And you have to develop the expertise in bypass as this will continue to play an emerging role uh, for aneurysms that have failed uh, endovascular therapy or that are not amenable to either coiling or clipping. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, sir, for the amazing talk. And everyone was so intrigued. We reached our maximum limit again. And uh, I had to send everyone towards YouTube. And everyone was so much glued uh, to YouTube as well. So thank you so much for your amazing lecture, sir. We are so honored and pleased. And like you have said, I think it is very important for everyone to know. I'm a young neurosurgeon myself. Uh, so I think it's very important for everyone to know the importance of clipping. And everyone should be, I think, every neurosurgeon should be well versed with clipping techniques. And obviously, it is very important especially there are certain um, indications when clipping is um, the right choice especially in younger patients so again so thank you so much for sharing your wonderful experience i actually came to um, read a read, read a paper a couple of months ago it was uh, published in neurosurgical focus that was on 3d uh, planning of uh, aneurysms like you have mentioned they showed that uh, they could just uh, plan uh, their patient on that 3D platform and used, and there was also a paper by Professor Ali Al Arad, I think, on virtual reality headsets, and they're used in how you can just have a good planning. I never knew it could be a very. I thought it's very interesting and it's very sci-fi, but uh, it was the first time I saw uh, that you have um, also advocated for this technique. So again, thank you so much, sir. I uh, do have one question regarding the fusiform aneurysm, sir. We see them quite rarely. But what's your point of view uh, regarding their man their treatment and their management, especially the reconstruction uh, for the fusiform aneurysms? And so, do you um, advocate? How, what's your view regarding the wrapping technique for those uh, aneurysms which cannot be uh, which where there is an incomplete clipping, or we feel like this should be wrapped because we've read about wrapping, but we have never seen this in our experience. Yeah, great questions. Um... Maria, I, I think um, the fusiform ones, certainly I, I always discuss these with my endovascular team. And, you know, a lot of times with the flow diverting techniques now, they're able to treat a lot of these. But if they can't, I, I think you have to figure out if you can clip reconstruct it and recreate the lumen with uh, fenestrated clips. Uh, sometimes you can't, and sometimes you have to think of bypass strategies so that you can do flow reversal, reverse the flow in, in some cases, but it's a case by case basis, of course. And then the wrapping technique I use frequently, if there's any residual and so forth, I will take uh, wisps of the cottonoid and shred it and put it around the neck and a little bit of fibrin glue, uh, which is what I, I, I typically do. Thank you so much. I think that it was an important question. We haven't said, seen such a patient, uh, but there was a patient who was about 14 years old. We came to know him about what, about a couple of years ago. He had the MCA fusiform aneurysm, uh, but he actually became Lama. He left us and uh, we don't know more about him, what happened to him. He didn't want any sort of uh, surgery, nothing. No, no. And we were like, uh, he's like an untold mystery for us right now. So I, it's like this question still haunts me. I don't know what, what might have happened to him or whatever it did to him but everyone was a little confused and everyone was like saying what to do because um uh, he was a uh, he was very very young and uh, we have never seen that sir i think the fusiform aneurysms have a lesser rupture rate as compared to the secular ones but i think they're still very very serious i see professor yuha in the uh, zoom my one of my heroes here in <laughs> vascular neurosurgery Hello, hello. Hi. Professor Yuha, uh, uh, thank you so much for joining us today, Professor Yuha. Uh, can you hear us? I think he's muted. <laughs> Professor Yuha, thank you so much for joining us today. Professor Yuha is here to give his final words and uh, before- I'm here. I'm here, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, sir. Thank you so much. Okay. Sir. May I say a few words? Yes, sir, please. Okay. It's, it was excellent lecture, of course. So this is how the things should be done. Good micronial surgery. Good micronial surgery, very clean, wonderful gripping. So you should save this, this lecture. And of course, the number of aneurysms is going down because endovascular is taking over. Why it is taking over? 
because there is one advertisement is that it is dangerous to open the head. This advertisement is going around the world. And I have last my last operation done in China. In China, it is traditionally extremely dangerous to open the head. They are very much afraid of it. And one of the things is that in many places, craniotomy, when you do craniotomy, then the beautiful female hair is shared, uh, saved. And this is, of course, a thing that cannot be tolerated. I shaved the uh, last time female hair 1982. So in China, everywhere in the world, the, fe the females, pre the ha hair is extremely important. Actually, it has been used to shave the hair as punishment during the Second World for, for the crimes to punish the females. So it is one of the terrible attacks for the females. So it's no wonder if you have a beautiful hair or if you are female, then you select endovascular surgery. The second thing is that the endovascular surgery is ex extremely uh, expensive. We are living in the First World War but I have, after retiring 2015 in Helsinki, because of the law, I became 68 years. So I had to go somewhere else to continue my passion to do microneurosurgery. So I was around the world, Peru, Indonesia, USA, and then Nepal, and then last close to four years in China. Chengzhou, Henan Provincial People's Hospital. So, this uh, you ha I have seen so many different ways to treat the aneurysms, but one of the things is that uh, rich people select endovascular surgery if they have money to pay. So, stents and coils in large and giant aneurysms, at least in China, in the communistic country. The price of them is like a big, for a big car or house or pole. And then the price for clip is low. So in China, I was the neurosurgeon for poor people because they di didn't have insurance and or money. And also many people had to leave the home because they didn't have any money. In Nepal, it was Nepal, which is the one of the more poor countries. So in Nepal, it was so that the money, female didn't have money for the clip, for single clip, because they had many children home and to pay $500. So they would have been without eating. So there are many different things here not only technical, uh, it is big competition here with getting the patient. I still think, like we were writing with Dr. Peerless, we continue to enjoy the perfect clip around the base of these deadly sacs. And I still think, you may think that I'm stupid, I've been a neurosurgery now 50 years, but I still think that the clipping of the base of the aneurysm remains the best treatment, long-lasting treatment, because in a small country, Finland, we, could, we can follow up the patients up to 50 years or until their death. So we know everything. So in big countries, you cannot follow up the patient. You have very poor follow-up. And when you follow up the patient cases 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, you will see surprises. You will see surprises. I think uh, those who can do good microneurosurgery, like Professor Liu, they should continue and do more because this encourages also younger population to take this field. 
Of course, the learning process is long. To operate on basilar bifurcation analysis will take 10 to 15 years before, before you are at that stage. But with endovascular, you can push calls already in the first year in the basilar artery analysis. But they recur, they recur, they recur. But you can be happy if you don't see the patient. So you should have a good follow up and then we could discuss. Then we could discuss what treatment is the best. I'm extremely sorry about this issue of study. If the issue of study would have had that level of treatment, like Professor Liu showed, wonderful clipping, perfect clipping, clean clipping, so it would have done by far better. That time, the surgical part was very low and the endovascular was doing well because it is, yeah, yeah. I'm not speaking about endovascular because I have been one part of it. And Guglielmi, for example, is my good friend and uh, Jack Love in Ukraine, one of the pioneers in Indra. And Norisma Baloning was, was a good friend. So, but I should think that, uh, say that, but this is important. There is no easy aneurysms. There are no easy aneurysms. If you this is you have wrong attitude, ah, this is easy aneurysm. I can do it even, even my mother could do it. This is nonsense. This is nonsense. So we should take seriously because we have only one chance to. only one chance to do the surgery. And I finish with a nice sentence of Professor Rake in our book on vertebral vascular aneurysms. So if we only could get a second chance for those who were lost or severely injured, with that, what we have learned in our operation room. This is what bites, this is what bites. So, because we become better, Dr. Luke is, Liu is doing better surgery than 50 years ago, of course, and younger generations are always getting better. So we should uh, give big support for them, big support for the younger generation not to think that uh, prevent, because the one who is teaching, he will get credit and can be proud of your boys and girls, like I say. It is forbidden to speak about girls nowadays, but in when, where I was born, it was a name of honor. that the females are good in neurosurgery. They take over in medical school, 70% of the students are females because the males have lost surgery for, for males have lost interest in surgery. So be careful, the road is long, long time, but learn anatomy, continue, this is hard job. When Dr. Drake died, my teacher, one of my teachers, great teachers, 98, so Professor Pierles was saying this important advice, how to become excellent neurosurgeon. Marry the right wife, that was number one advice. And then after that came technical things and learn anatomy and so on. I think this is this is the thing nowadays, of course, because females come to neurosurgery, like in Finland, half of the fem neurosurgeons are females. So you have to select the right, right spouse. But what is important, you have to have support in your work. I call neurosurgery, heart contact sports, physically and emotionally. So you have to be a good condition and to have good support from surrounding.
I I don't want to give another lecture. You know me. I can continue this until <laughs> late. I I just said there that uh, I have been very fortunate to have working coming from and working from in a small country. I operated my first in 1976, and I think think it was by far too early. But after that, I operated thousands of cases, actually 6,500 plus cases and more than 600 posterior circulation aneurysms. So technically, Professor Liu, you don't seem to do coagulation, you don't coagulate the aneurysms. And then the second thing, when the aneurysm ruptures, I was using adenosine, injecting adenosine immediately, and this was very helpful. Now I stop. I speak a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for your talk, Professor uh, Professor Lewis, please. Oh, I'm just going to say uh, thank you, Professor Yuha. You, um, you've been an icon for many of us with your large experience and teachings over the years on uh, aneurysm surgery. And you know, thank you for all your contributions and, and wisdom. Uh, we appreciate your remarks. Sir, thank you so much for your work. You are not using adenosine. I'm asking. You oh, I using <laughs> yeah, I, I do use it uh, time to time uh, I if I need to. But if I think if I can control with temporary clipping, uh, I don't have to use adenosine. But I, I have used adenosine, mostly AVM rupture cases where I need to get the bleeding in, under control. I, I think I use adenosine more on AVM than I, I do uh, aneurysm ruptures. But adenosine is a very good technique. I think every vascular neurosurgeon needs to be comfortable with the dosage and knowing how to use it uh, in, in times of trouble. It is the teamwork. You have a team in the operation room. I'm not using adenosine. It is the anesthetist has injection ready. When I swear in the operation room, it means that now we have to act very quickly. Everyone is silent. I put temporary clip or adenosine, and then we treat the rupture site. In China, the arteries are terrible, terrible atherosclerosis. I, this is so. You cannot use temporary clips, and I will couldn't use not also not use use uh, adenosine because the patients have severe pulmonary disease and were extremely heavy smokers. Seventy five percent of the males were heavy smokers. So this is different societies. Different are treating the patients different. So these other it's actually not medical indication, they are social indication and and but one of the things is important. You should be aware how your patients are doing. Not first day after operation we see in the uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, we see proud pictures, but when you see 15 years later, those cases, like in Finland, you can follow up. So you, you leave surprises. So, okay, I stop now. Thank you very much. It was excellent lecture and you are excellent, excellent micro surgeon. So your people, uh, your patients certainly feel well. I'm many times told by the family before the operation, good luck for the operation. I say, this is not luck, this experience and skills. When the family is saying, we pray for your hands, then I say, thank you very much. I will, I will do well.
Thank you so much, sir, for your talk, sir. Professor Liu, we have got a lot of comments for you because everyone is so happy to listen to your wonderful lecture and uh, people are saying sending you so much so many big thanks and actually i've just received a message someone is requesting uh, you to kindly uh, deliver a lecture for the trainees and younger neurosurgeons uh, the tips and tricks to avoid premature intraoperative rupture uh, and rhythmal rupture sir so everybody really wants to have you again because your lecture was so uh, much impressive for all of us so again thank you so much sir and i think that uh, i really wish to request you on his behalf as well that, that whenever it is convenient for you please do uh, deliver a lecture on tips and tricks on how to avoid premature intraoperative and rhythmal rupture thank you i'd be happy to yeah, prepare next, month. next next time so Dr. Mahmoud Bas has okay. got one question. He wants to know about your opinion regarding endoscopic assisted flipping. Yeah, I think uh, the endoscope is another tool that we can use in our armamentarium. Um, if you know what its role is, it's very useful. I think it's very useful in looking around the corner where you don't have the same line of sight from the microscope. And it's good to check your, uh, verify your anatomy and check your clip placement to make sure there's no residual or there's no occlusion of any hidden perforators. Um, I, I think uh, pure endoscopic clipping is probably not what I would favor. I think you should use the microscope. It gives you hands-free, uh, more mobility, um, but use the endoscope as your adjunct. That's my opinion. Thank you so much, sir. Um, I think the, the adenosine question, was, I was so surprisingly about to ask you about the adenosine circulatory arrest. Uh, Professor, you had just asked this question. It's very interesting for me. Thank you so much for your elaborate answer. I think uh, there were, most of the time, the, the endoscopic question was what everyone wanted to uh, ask you. And I think your uh, lecture was so elaborate that many of the questions have already been asked, have already been answered by you during the lecture. So again, sir, thank you so much for your time and for all this amazing lecture and all the wonderful videos, sir. Everyone really enjoyed the videos because it was like having an experience of our own going through all these things. Sir, I'm actually also planning to um, integrate virtual reality in, in the Zoom uh, meeting. So I hope that uh, I will be happy to one day have the honor of inviting you to uh, uh, to deliver this lecture in virtual reality. It's quite easy for us to convert it. So with so much high definition videos, it's quite easy to have a very um, lifelike experience. So like you have already mentioned, for most of us who have not have got a lot of experience in vascular neurosurgery, it will be uh, like a game changer uh, to have this um, wonderful experience, especially learning from legends like you, because uh, it was um, like during this, I always say that the same thing that during this pandemic, we had this very huge and lucky um, opportunity. We think we are so lucky to have this opportunity of learning from people like you. We used to just um, um, go and attend our conferences and have a chance to to do a few words from you or we could uh, just uh, uh, read the journals with your papers in it and your chapters and so it was it, it's like a huge privilege for us to have finally have to having a chance of actually interacting with you and asking questions with you so again thank you so much for sparing your time sir thank you maria Thanks, it's uh... It's great to be here this morning and uh, thank you for the kind remarks and uh, I hope everyone got a lot out of uh, the material and can apply them to their own surgeries to help their patients. Thank you so much, sir. Honor and pleasure is all uh, all ours. It's it's a big thing that you spare time from your very busy schedule. So again, sir, I think we have taken a lot of time from you, especially on this very early morning at your end. So again, I think that it's it's time to wrap up the session. So I would like to uh, invite Professor Juha to uh, to wrap up the session. Just a few words, and uh, and Professor. Uh, James Kilio, would you like to give us some a word of advice, uh, especially to to the to the young neurosurgeons? You ask me. 
Sir, I would also like to say, uh, ask you to say a few words, and then I would I like to request Professor Liu to say a few words of advice for the younger neurosurgeons. Whom are you asking now? You are speaking so fast. <laughs> okay, My <sorry>. English is <laughs> broken English. I cannot understand. I learned to use very slowly because the people came with, with very poor English to it. I'm a non-native as well. Video. I'm a non-native as well. <laughs> You are doing so, better than last I, time. I, I think, Professor Yuha, we, we would like to hear your, your closing remarks, and then I will follow with some of my words after you. Thank you very much. So I, what to say to younger neurosurgeons? I had my heroes. I had Yasakil, Drake, PLS, Konovalov, and so on. And during the time, I got also younger heroes, oh, especially the same age or a little bit older than me. But then during the time, I learned that there are extremely good younger neurosurgeons around the world. So they became my, my heroes. Also, also like uh, Lawton, Tanikawa, and then in China, Xupin who has done more than 10,000 bypasses, is a young man and continues. And so many others. I think the important thing is to cooperate well. It's very sad that there is a war in, in Europe now. I have very good friends in Russia, very good friends in Ukraine. Of course, the war is far away for you, but it, it is close to us. Finland has 1,300 kilometers border with Russia. And now we are preparing for war because we don't know what this crazy, crazy dictator is doing. So this influences a lot our world. And the wars continue. We should co cooperate, not fight, and share the share the knowledge. I was close to four years in China. What I saw: excellent neurosurgeons, excellent neurosurgeons. Flow of the patients is like the Yellow River or Shangxi River. They come and come and come, and beautiful difficult case collections, but they are not publishing. This is this is so sad. This is so sad. And they are closing more the country, so we should cooperate with and, and uh, so we will develop better now. And uh, So, I learned from Yasakil, Drake, PLS, very quick, short advice. Work hard, learn anatomy. Work hard, learn anatomy. And my own religion, I don't belong to any church, is that uh, work hard, Help the, help, the, help the people. So, because we are part of the society, so we should support the society. So, yeah, I'm speaking too much. If you let me speak, so I will continue and continue. So, Professor Liu, please, you say the final words now. Well, I, I think you echoed uh, a lot of my philosophies as well. I, I tried to follow in your footsteps. I, I agree. You have to know the anatomy. You have to study hard. And I would also add that you need to, if you have an opportunity, spend time in the cadaver lab. Uh, you know, cadaver skull-based dissection helps to enhance your microsurgical skills. And, 
you know, take the time to, you know, visit other neurosurgeons. I, I think it's, it enhances and opens your mind and helps you, you know, learn new techniques and, um, and refine techniques that you're already working on. And if, you know, now that uh, the world hopefully is opening up, take the opportunity to do that. Uh, I think you will be inspired by others and, and you'll be able to learn and continue to fuel the passion. And if you're passionate about this kind of work, um, it's not going to be work. It's, it's, it's becomes a hobby and it becomes, you know, your passion, your daily passion to strive for, uh, you know, perfection, to strive for technical excellence. And ultimately the goal is so that you can improve the quality of life of your patients and that you can make a difference in the world. And when you do that, there's no greater satisfaction in your professional life when you can make a positive impact on your patients. And so, um, you know, continue to follow your dreams. Uh, don't let obstacles or other people, you know, tell you no. Um, you know, keep keep the passion alive and, uh, you know, aim high. Aim high and pursue your dreams. I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, sir. It is cool, good to have a dog. Yeah. It's, <laughs> where's my dog? She ran away. <laughs> because they're always happy when you come home. <laughs> Pets are very uh, sincere. You know, I mean, we've got a cat. So I think the pet pets are very, very sincere friends. <laughs> Again, thank you so much, sir. Sir, it, it means a lot, sir. I think Professor Martin Vitili uh, has uh, added a comment. Uh, he he has added that uh, he has got some message for us as well. So Professor Martin Vitili is also a student neurosurgeon. So he's saying that my advice is as I have trained with Professor Yashar Gill as a resident but learned the clipping elsewhere, I got used to arteries dissect them out in, in other surgeries, preserving veins, learn how to preserve vessels using straight flips of 7 mm, which can be ordered for $34 on Alibaba. And the important thing is to learn delicate micro dissection. And um, he has learned some tricks, sir. I think he has he has been uh, Professor Yuha's colleague in the, uh, while he was with Professor Yashar Gil. So uh, thank you, Dr. Martin, for your very, very nice comments. We'll be really pleased to have you someday with us as well. So again, sir, thank you so much for your time. And again, I think it's time to wrap up the session. And we, I, I think we actually, all of us don't want to say goodbye to each other and to our host and our speakers and attendees. And everyone is very, very much uh, excited because they have got a lot to learn and a lot of information has been flowing through your lectures and a lot of videos were there. So I think that uh, everyone is quite but still, so uh, because we, because I can just imagine that you are quite 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 busy. So again, sir, thank you so much. I think I'm going to we are going to wrap up this session finally. Again, sir, thank you so much for spending your precious time. Uh, and we are looking forward to uh, have the privilege of inviting you again in one of our next webinars. Now okay. the tips and now the tips and tricks of uh, avoiding intraoperative. A free of uh, intraoperative rupture of aneurysmal ruptures. I think that that's what he asked, and there are others who have also asked for the same thing. So I think, sir, whenever it is convenient for you, we will going. We will be honored to invite you again. <laughs> of course, we will be in touch, Maria, and uh, happy to do so. Thank you so much, sir. It's it's really kind of you, and it means so much because uh, all of your uh, lectures um, means um, it are will be translated into a much better healthcare from um, the young neurosurgeons who are enthusiastic about learning and whatever we can do. We promise you that we will always try to uh, extend the frontiers of neurosurgery, and we will try to um, take all your guidance and all your teaching seriously one day it, it 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 makes a lot of it's going to make a lot of difference in neurosurgery and we need people like you like professor you have mentioned that people like you will, should never get retried and should always be serving because um, there are only a few people who 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 are like you and who are so much keen to share and teach others as well so it's a good thing
Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks a lot. Thank you. For the thank you. For the attendees, I have shared the link to download your certificate. Uh, so you just have to click on that link and send me a request to access. I will uh, give you uh, give you the uh, uh, access after after the show. So again, thank you so much for joining us today.